Hi everybody, it's uh, Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. I hope you're doing very well. I am broadcasting from the Agora Conference, which uh, is uh, being held online at the moment. And I hope that you can uh, join us. Well, I hope that you have joined us. And uh, I guess we have 31 viewers on at the moment. So we will start in just a split second while I get my techno crappies together. And thank you for your patience. Of course, uh, had to uh, had to endure a slight browser crash, even though we've tested before. But here we go. So uh, I would like to. I'm just going to see if there's any way that people can contact me here. Uh, I think we went through this once before, uh, and I don't see any messages. But I'm going to assume that we are live. So, uh, this is uh, communicating about freedom for the uh, Agora IO conference, and thanks so much, George, for inviting me back. And the first thing I wanted to talk about here was, let me focus this, this is supposed to be an autofocus, was that what seems to happen in the realm of freedom is that people will talk about freedom in its most abstract sense. In other words, a sense that has nothing to do with their daily lives, with this, the decisions that they can actually make in their daily lives. And I think that's a real shame. I think that's a real problem. What happens is people will argue about abstract freedom, and then the closer that freedom gets to be, to be implementable in their own lives, the closer it gets to being actionable in their own lives, the more it seems to dissipate and vanish, which I think is a real tragedy, a real tragedy. It reminds me of what used to occur in the sort of mid to late Middle Ages. Uh, it was called scholasticism. And you would have people writing these endless tracts about very esoteric theological questions. So for example, one question that came up in the later Middle Ages was, did Adam, did Adam have a belly button? This consumed uh, more vellum than your average Dungeons and Dragons campaign. The reason being that it was a very, very important and challenging question for the, uh, the, for the theocrats of the Middle Ages because mm, Adam was supposed to be made in God's image. And God obviously doesn't have a belly button because he's God and was never born. But Adam, if Adam has a belly button, then he can't be made in God's image. If Adam does have a belly button, he's not made in God's image, but then we all are who have belly buttons. But if Adam doesn't have a belly button, then Adam therefore is made in God's image, then we are less in God's image because we have belly buttons. So, and, and the angels dancing on the head of a pin, all this kind of stuff. And this occurred generally after the rediscovery of the ancient Greek texts, which were pretty secular, and of course, when people discovered the virtue of people like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, there were lots of questions about, does Socrates get to go to heaven because uh, he was a good man, or does he get to go to heaven because he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, which he couldn't because he was 500 years prior to J.C.'s birth. So, these kinds of questions, when there was a lot of Greco-Roman classical skepticism about religion, these kinds of questions drew people in. I argue that they drew people in like flies into a spider's web. You know, you, the more you move, the more you get bound up in these kinds of things. I think it was really tragic. Uh, hu you know, huge amounts of mental energy, huge amounts of great minds being consumed by these very esoteric and abstract and obtuse questions. And I think that there's a lot less of that in the libertarian movement, but there's still more of it than, than I would like. And so one of the tricks about communicating uh, ideas of freedom, ideals of freedom, is that you are generally only allowed or encouraged to discuss aspects of liberty that people can't act on, that they can't act on, you know, with the exception of voting, which we can talk about a little later. But people can't act on these principles uh, and 
you'll get drawn into these very esoteric debates. So one that came up a couple of years ago, which I've mentioned before on the show. If you haven't <laughs> seen the show, you'll know it's new for you, I guess. After 2,000 podcasts, all I have left is new for people who haven't seen the show that yet. But it's the idea that you know uh, property rights are, are very important, and um, yet if you're hanging from a plank pole and you're going to kick in a window to dive into somebody's apartment, you're going to invade their property rather than die, which is that life is more important than property rights, therefore we need a welfare state, blah, blah, blah. And, of course, these things don't occur. They don't occur in, in real life. This is an, I can't think of a single recorded instance where either that's occurred or if it has occurred where the person has been really bothered by the invasion of his property by somebody who would otherwise have plummeted to his death. I think that would be great. I mean, <laughs> I just wish they would do it when I was podcasting or, or doing a video even better. They would come kicking in my window and we would have a great discussion about property rights and I would have the thrill of having saved someone's life, however indirectly. So, I mean, this stuff doesn't really happen. Another one, of course, is um, if I put a toe on someone's property, can they shoot me? Uh, again, these are things that don't happen uh, in, in the real world. Uh, and so you're kind of allowed to discuss issues of philosophy and morality and liberty in these very abstract and obtuse areas where you can't really act. There's nothing particularly real about it. And so it's sort of like you're allowed to be brave in a fantasy game like Dungeons and Dragons, but you're not allowed to be brave in, in real life. And so one of the things that I've talked about for many years and will continue, I'm sure, <laughs> to talk about until they uh, throw me in a hole in the ground with dirt in my eye is that I think it's very important to take, let's just talk about discussions. I mean, I've talked about other kinds of actions you can take to promote liberty, but let's just talk about discussions or debates. There is something in the approach that people take in medical school that I find very interesting and very worthwhile. So in medical school, of course, you deal a lot with the most common ailments and the ones that, you know, maybe the symptoms are a little hard to find, but the ailments are pretty common. Uh, and again, I've not been to medical school, but, you know, I'm sure you deal with how to detect uh, appendicitis, uh, uh, diabetes, uh, various kinds of infections and what to test for, and again, all these, you know, the common stuff, 90% of what people go to doctors for, and you may, of course, uh, get warning signs for cancer. Of course, I'm sure if you're a dermatologist, I know if you're a dermatologist, you'll get all the warning signs for skin cancers and all these other kinds of things. And that, to me, is very instructive when it comes to thinking about how to communicate about liberty, which is think of yourself in medical school. So when someone comes up to you with one of these hanging from a flagpole, toe over the property line, somebody uh, plants a flag uh, on a new continent and claims the entire continent for themselves and so on. Ask yourself whether these kinds of questions would really ever be taught or even asked in medical school, analogous to somebody who was sick. So, you know, uh, 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 somebody comes in and, you know, their arm has fallen off and, you know, their toes are currently on fire, uh, they're having a heart attack and uh, an aneurysm and uh, they have appendicitis and a blood clot, deep vein thrombosis or something. What do you do? Well, I don't know, you take some pictures and get into a medical journal, I suppose, but this, you know, this is never going to happen in real life. It's never going to happen in real life. So it's almost like every time you set up a rule, like, you know, property rights, the non-aggression principle, people immediately are drawn to the exception. And I really think that's a, a pretty fatal trap because we end up arguing about really theoretical, non-existent, non-important kinds of issues in alternate dimensions with uh, people who will never act in that way and situations that will never arise. And what we do is we effectively remove our philosophical intelligence from what can actually create and make change within society. I think that's truly, truly tragic and something which we should studiously try as hard as we can to avoid. It's like we vault over that which we can actually discuss and which is really obvious and then we go in hot pursuit 
of the really obtuse and the really abstract. So, of course, in the Middle Ages, they should have been talking about what are the arguments for and against the existence of God. And, of course, St. Augustine and other theologians were. But, uh, of course, for a variety of pretty terrifying reasons, a lot of skeptics and atheists weren't. But they should have been asking that question, not questions around how do you reconcile this Bible passage with this Bible passage, or does Adam have a belly button, or how many angels can dance on the head of the pin, and, and so on. Can God create a rock so heavy that he himself cannot lift it? Because <laughs> God, of course, has arms, no belly button, but arms. But I really think it's important when we're discussing things to talk about the real elephants in the room, right? The initiation of force around taxation, the initiation of force around a monopoly of money printing, God help us, the initiation of force around war, the initiation of force around the war on drugs, the initiation of force, a little bit more delicately to put, around things like public school and so on. I think those are really, really important. And in order to make that case, then you have to make a case for property rights, non-aggression principle, and then immediately you will, the people will try to draw you out into this really abstract realm of, um, you know, what would property rights be in a mining astro asteroid uh, off Alpha Centauri in the year 2562. And then when you can't answer those questions or have trouble with those questions, they'll say, aha, there's no foundation for property rights. And of course, that's, that's one half of the equation where we get drawn out of really dealing with the meat of the issue in the present. The other is that we get drawn into the prognostication business about how the roads will be built, how the schools will be built, how the children will be educated, how the poor will get their IV drips in the far future. And both of those are really, really bad traps <laughs> to, to get involved with. And I'd strongly suggest trying to stay away from them as much as humanly possible. And to return to, look, say, look, even if we say that some realms of intellectual property are challenging, or homesteading asteroids may be challenging, or, 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 or. There may be property rights around fish in the ocean that may be challenging. Absolutely. But I view us as physicians in a time of plague. And physicians in a time of plague, bound, we assume, by their Hippocratic Oath, are going to try and help the people who are sick, yea, verily, unto death, on their doorsteps, in the streets, uh, lining the avenues, falling off bridges. And the really abstract, maybe possible problems are after the plague is dealt with, right? So if you're the doctor in the middle of a plague and someone comes up and says, you know, it would be really tough to treat a disease that came in from an asteroid that was silicon-based. You're like, yeah, okay. Can you pass me some rubbing alcohol? Can you get me a bandage? Can you do me something useful? Can you do me a solid and help out these people who are dying of plague here? And let's not worry about the extraterrestrial vaccines that may fall from the sky 500 years from now. Or you know, someone can say, you're in the middle of a plague, and someone can say, you know, wow, you know, wouldn't it be terrible if AIDS was airborne? like, well, yeah, that would be terrible if AIDS were airborne. Can we deal with the, the, the plague that we have right in front of us without worrying about ina imaginary disaster scenarios that are very unlikely to happen uh, at some point in the future? Let's deal with what we have now. And so in a sense, right, so people are constantly trying to draw you into not debating things in the present. I mean, that's, it's really terrible and it's really challenging. The, the, the real elephants in the room, people are kind of drawing to draw you away. Like if you really wanted a plague to continue, you'd try and engage you tempt the doctors, you dangle these hooks in front of the doctors with these tasty intellectual tidbits that they might get really interested in, and you would focus on that. And that would be uh, what you would do to draw the doctors away from dealing with the plague currently coursing through the streets, uh, making the, uh, the gutters run yellow and red with <laughs> vomit and blood. You would try and draw them into helping actual patients by getting them involved in really abstract and, and uh, obtuse dis discussions. And in the same way that in the scholastic period uh, in the later Middle Ages, 
a lot of this really esoteric questions that were floating around were a way of trying to avoid the elephant in the room of, you know, there are these intellectual giants we admire from the ancient world who had no concept of Christianity. That's tricky, <laughs> right? I mean, the Romans, later Romans did, but the, the Greeks, classical Greeks certainly didn't. That's really tricky because it's kind of tough to say that Socrates is evil because he wasn't baptized. So it's a way of distracting you from the core questions. It's a way of keeping you away from the patients who you can really help and drawing you into these cloud castles of what ifs. And I think it's really to the detriment of the movement to, to, to just try and avoid those temptations. They're really tempting because we feel, of course, that if we can dot every I and cross every T, if we can, if we can just cover every base, if we can answer every question, if we can come up with credible solutions for every conceivable way in which the free market can solve goods, uh, market failure goods, market problems, uh, goods currently provided by governments, if we can just find a way to answer every question, then we will change people's minds. But I think that is not the case. I mean, I'll just to look at the um, profession of economics to see that. I mean, econo economists for 300 years, they have a number of things that are in, not in dispute. A lot of them, like Keynesianism, God, it's back, right? I mean, but that's not, that's sort of, to some degree, in dispute. The fact that free trade increases productivity, absolutely not in dispute. The fact that two people voluntarily trading both end up better is not uh, uh, under dispute. And yet, these policies have not manifested themselves in any kind of consistent real world policies, even after three, four hundred years of consistency among the profession. So if tens of thousands of economists over centuries cannot get a consensus in the general population about things as simple as free trade increases wealth, or free trade increases efficiency, or the division of labor increases efficiency, if people can't accept those basic ideas in the general population despite their incontrovertible, incontrovertible nature among the specialists who've been around for centuries and tens of thousands of them with Nobel Prizes and all these kinds of PhDs from really hoity-toity Ivy League schools. If that can't be achieved, then it seems to me pretty impossible to imagine that any individual, no matter how eloquent and how great at uh, getting ideas across, sorry, I just repeated myself, but hey, <laughs> it's filler people, give me a break. No matter how eloquent we are, if tens of thousands of economists can't get simple ideas across the general population over four centuries, we really don't have a chance. And of course, the questions are not designed to be answered. No matter what answer you come up with about how the roads will be built, there will be another question. And even if you answer everything about how the roads will be built, they'll move on to some other topic, and some other topic, and some other topic, and you literally can spend the rest of your life just with one person who's skeptical making these explanations. And what you're doing is you're leaving the sick and dying in the streets and going up to the ivory tower to discuss philosophy rather than doing what you should be doing, I think, which is to talk about the basics of ethics in a free society and the reality of the evils that we face in a state of society. The initiation of the use of force is the foundation of government, right? Sticking a gun in someone's ribs to get them to do what you want, to give you money, to give you uh, the, your, their kids for educational purposes, this is all wrong. It's wrong. If people can't admit that that's wrong, if people can't admit that using violence to pretend to solve social problems, if they can't admit that's not wrong, move on. Move on. It's triage. If somebody doesn't have the intellectual and moral common sense of your average epileptic goose, then just keep moving. And this is what you do, right? If you're in a situation of a plague, there's lots of people around who you can't save, right? And there's some people around that you can save. So you ask those questions you know, is it wrong to use violence to get, right? as Mark Stevens says, is it wrong to supply goods and services at the point of a gun? If somebody says, no, it's not wrong, or they want to get drawn into some abstract discussion and won't take a stand on such a simple and basic issue, move on, move on, move on. Uh, lots of people are past help, are past hope, are too in the matrix, uh, are too embedded in propaganda, are too embedded in the delusions of statism. Keep moving. Find those people who are like, huh, I never thought about that before. I don't know. Pint of a gun? Really? Tell me more about that. that that's weird. It doesn't make sense to me, but I'm willing to listen. Those are the people that you want to talk to because they actually have ears. Otherwise, you're, just look, you're, you're trying to dance with statues. I mean, you're just going to scratch yourself and maybe the statue will fall over, but you're never going to get any Buster Rhymes in. So don't talk to people without ears. Uh, talk to people who can actually communicate 
uh, who can actually listen, who have intellectual curiosity, and keep moving and keep moving, but don't get embedded in discussions. People do this with their families and their friends all the time. Right? Get involved in these discussions that go on and on for years. They bleed energy from you. Uh, very often they will go nowhere. I mean, sometimes they will. Lovely, <laughs> that's what we like to see, but often they will go nowhere. And really try to avoid it's such a temptation, you know, oh, if I can get this person to understand one more thing, they're going to be fine. But the goal of most people when faced with new and challenging ideas, the goal of most people is to reject them. And if they're even more cunning, it is to paralyze the speaker of the great ideas with doubts and fears and insecurities and blah, 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 blah. And they do that by coming up with esoteric, impossible, who cares questions and then saying, if you fail to answer them, then you lack intellectual integrity. If you fail to answer my questions, then you're just uh, dogmatic. If you fail to answer my questions, you are not being consistent. If you fail to answer my questions, they, they set themselves up in the position of examiner, and then you are the uh, you know, on your knees, hat in hand, Dickensian kind of supplicant who's trying to get them to approve your message, your ideas. And don't fall into that. You know, if people can't see the violence of the system, uh, then debating them won't help. This, this kind of aggression, like the, the aggression of statism, you, you, you see it or you don't. I mean, this, you, you see it or you don't. And seeing it doesn't mean you get it. I mean, I'm still learning about it 30 years in. But seeing it doesn't mean that you just automatically get it, no problem, anywhere, rah, you know. But it means that you're like, whoa, that electric shock of a new idea. I'll give you one last example, then I'll see if there's a way to get uh, questions from you delicious people. There's a saying in science. I'm not a scientist, God knows. So, so um, I don't know how true it is. Maybe it's true. Probably seems true. Which is to say that new ideas, like old ideas, people don't get deconverted from old ideas to new ideas. You just wait for the people who believe in the old ideas to retire or die, and then the people who have the new ideas move in. And this is quite often the case. And so even in the realm of science, where people are trained in empiricism, trained in rationality, trained in the scientific method, and their careers can be uh, made by the acceptance of new ideas, and they'll have great friends among the younger people who have these new ideas. So all of these people, and, and still even in the sciences, it takes a long, long time, and most people don't seem to be able to adjust too much to new ideas or new arguments or new ways of thinking, or better ways of thinking, more accurate ways. So that's just, an, again, that's anecdotal or bromidal. I don't know if it's true or not, but if it is true, that's another example that even scientists have real difficulty getting new ideas. And that's just ego-based. I mean, that's not even around morals. That's not even around ethics. Ethics are much more volatile than new scientific theories because ethics turn everybody's world topsy-turvy. Ethics is uh, a landmine. Click. Oh, dear. We're in the realm of ethics. <laughs> I better put on my blast furnace. Anyway, so I hope that uh, that makes sense. These are my approaches. Don't get involved in esoteric discussions. Uh, don't get involved in trying to answer every conceivable rotating disco ball question of future possibilities and solutions. Just keep focusing on, you know, do you, do you at least see the aggression and violence that's in our society at the moment? Do you at least see that the war on drugs is immoral? Do you at least see that taxation has moral problems? Even if you don't agree with that, there are moral problems about taxation that uh, all of these kinds of, if, if people see it, great, you know, then they're in the amber zone of triage, and if people don't see it, they're in the red and intellectually dead, and I really believe you have to move on to people who can be saved, and that efficiency principle is really, really important. So, uh, hey, 24 minutes, not too bad. I, um, I'll just see, I know I went through this last time, I think it was in February, where we tried to find a way for me to be able to answer questions that people had, and uh, I'm just going to, let me just log on to Skype and see if old George is around, and uh, see if we can't, well, if anybody has any questions, oh, how could you have questions? It's all just too clear for words. Let's see. Hello, George. Hello, Jeff. Uh, if anyone knows, my Skype ID is uh, S-T-E-F-A-N underbar M-O-L-Y N-E-U-X, or I think you can post this on Facebook, uh, and you can let me know if there's any way to, um, to communicate with people.
I last time I remember, I think it was over on Facebook or something like that. Yeah, if you if you have me on Facebook, if you could just send me a message or write in my wall about how to uh, do that. And we'll see if we can get any answers. Q and A. I like the Q and A. Just, uh, I just, oh, somebody pinged me. Ah. Pause the video feed so you don't hear yourself. <gasps> oh, actually, no, I have my, um, I don't have my speakers on, so it should be okay. 